Hey guys, just me, uh, Mr. Plazic. Uh, what this video series is going to go over, it's going to go over chapter four with you in the Essentials of Human Anatomy Physiology uh, textbook and help prepare you for the skin and body membranes. Um, this is our skin that we have right here. So this is going to be the bulk of what I'm going to talk about. But in the beginning of this, I'm going to talk a little bit about membranes of the, uh, of the human body itself. All right, so here we go. This is, uh, like I said, this is chapter four that we're going over. So first thing we take a look at it is the body membranes that we have. And basically what a membrane is, is a membrane is going to cover uh, the surface of the body. Um, it's also going to line body cavities. So anytime we have an opening, that's going to be lined uh, with some type of membrane. Um, and it provides a, uh, basically what it does is it helps provide a protective sheet um, around organs as well. And how we classify these particular um, membranes is according to their tissue type. So we either classify them as an epithelial membrane or we classify them as a connective tissue membrane. Now, if I say epithelial membrane, um, basically it has connective tissue in it, but it has epithelial tissue as well. Whereas a connective tissue membrane has just connective tissue that's associated with it. And we study those different tissue types when we talked a little bit about um, those tissues in chapter three. Uh, the major epithelial membranes that we have is a cutaneous membrane, a mucous membrane, a serous membrane, and then the major connective tissue membrane that we have is a synovial membrane. On your test, you can expect, guys, we can ask you a question like, which of the following is classified as an epithelial membrane? Which of the following is not an epithelial membrane? So those types of questions we can ask you in a multiple choice type setting. So the first type of membrane that I have is your skin. It's a cutaneous membrane. Um, it's a dry membrane, and basically everyone knows where their skin at. It's the outermost protective boundary of their body. Um, the outside of their skin is composed of uh, keratinized, stratified, squamous epithelial cells. Um, basically, these cells are going to form. Uh, they're real tightly joined together. They secrete a chemical that's called keratin that acts kind of as, as a waterproofing agent for your skin. Beneath that, we have the dermis. So we have the top layer um, that we have is the epidermis and then we move beneath there then we have the dermis itself um, which is connective tissue um, mostly dense connective tissue uh, that we have that's associated with the dermis when we look at leather um, leather is dermis if those of you guys that are wearing like leather shoes or have leather purses and things like that so this is your connective this is your uh, your cutaneous membrane that's a, that is a uh, an epithelial membrane the next uh, membrane that we have is a mucous membrane. Now, mucous membrane has the word mucus in it. So we know that this has to have some type of uh, absorption or secretion property that's associated with it. Um, and this is going to be have epithelial tissue that's with it. This is an epithelial membrane. Um, and depending upon the location of this membrane, it's going to be co composed of stratified squamous epithelial. Uh, like we take a look at your mouth and your esophagus. Um, if we take a look at the rest of your digestive tract, it's going to be lined with simple columnar epithelial. Um, beneath that, we have a connective tissue that we call the lamina propria. Uh, where we find mucous membranes, it's going to line all body cavities that open to the exterior body surface. And what that means is like if this tube that we have inside of our body is exposed to the external environment, things like your mouth, your esophagus, your stomach, your large intestine, your small intestine, inside of your lungs, um, this is where we're going to find this mucous membrane. Um, a lot of times these membranes are slippy. Um, if we feel the inside of them to help reduce friction and things like that uh, when I look at a particular mucous membrane. Right here's an, an image of the different mucous membranes. We take a look like inside your nose is a mucous membrane. Um, no, you have snot inside your nose. nose. That's that mucus that's inside your nose. It's going to help trap incoming particles and debris and viruses and bacterium and things like that. Can you get caught in that mucus? Um, inside your mouth. Um, as we move down here, we can see inside of your uh, larynx, uh, moving down this tubule, here is your trachea. Uh, moving down your trachea, we get to your bronchi, um, but all inside, the, inside of your lungs is all going to be a mucous membrane. I can come the other way, I can come down your esophagus, um, then I can move, make my way into my stomach, inside of your large, small intestine, large intestine. This is all going to be a mucous membrane. So it's going to line these body uh, areas that are exposed to the external um, environment is where I find the, uh, the mucous membranes themselves. Uh, the next membrane is a membrane that's not exposed to the external environment. Um, and this is going to line all open body cavities that are close to the exterior of the body. It's called a serous membrane. And the, uh, the serous membrane consists of simple squamous epithelial. And basically you have, it's kind of like an Oreo cookie when I take a look at it, is if, uh, if I have an organ, let me grab an organ here real quick and kind of explain this. 
So when I look at a uh, when I look at a serous membrane, um, serous membranes, like I said, is going to cover these uh, these basically areas that uh, are not exposed to the external environment. Um, this is the heart right here. So right here I have a heart, and basically this heart sits in a serous membrane. So we're going to use this bag to kind of represent that particular serous membrane that I have here. So I'll put this heart in a bag. When I look at this bag itself, so when I look at this bag itself. Okay, there's part of the bag that's not touching the heart. This outside of the bag is not coming in part of the heart. Think of this kind of as two layers. You have an outside layer that's not coming in contact with the, law, with the heart. Then you have a, an internal layer, okay, that's actually coming in, in, in contact with the heart itself. So you have a visceral layer. The visceral layer is that part of the bag that's touching the heart. And then you have the parietal layer, which is on the outside that's not touching the heart. In between the visceral layer and the parietal layer, you have a fluid. Okay, you have, a, you have a fluid that's in there to help reduce friction because you think of this heart that's constantly moving around and doing those different types of things. Um, I kind of think of it kind of like an Oreo cookie. Um, so you have an Oreo cookie that's sitting here, okay, that's on the outside. Then you have the, the, the white cream filling that's on the middle that's right here. So you have that white cream filling. That's going to represent the fluid. And then you have an internal cookie that's right here. Okay, and that's going to be the part that touches the actual organ itself. So you have the visceral layer and the parietal layer that's here. In between here, you have that cream filling that is a fluid that's going to help reduce friction as this heart moves around is what you have. So these serous membranes are given specific names um, for the particular organs or structures that they're going to be covering. So serous membranes occur in pairs separated by serous fluid. That's what I just tried to explain to you with that Oreo cookie analogy. Um, you have the visceral layer that's going to cover the organ, and then you have that fluid in between, then you have the parietal layer that's on the outside that's not touching the organ itself. Um, this is trying to explain that again. Um, we take a look at the actual uh, parietal and visceral layer here, putting your hand into a, a balloon itself. Um, serous membranes are given specific names um, depending upon the location in their body. Um, the serous membranes that covers the, uh, the abdominal cavity, the digestive system organs, uh, like the small intestine, the large intestine, is called the peritoneum. Um, you have a serous membrane that surrounds your lungs. It's called the pleura. And then we just showed you the one that surrounds the heart that's called the pericardium. So those are specific serous membranes. This example of the serous membranes, there's your pericardium, here's your pleura, and then here's your peritoneum. Um, that's there. These are all going to help reduce friction because you have this constant moving and churning of these organs um, and you don't want to have high heat being developed as they rub against other structures. The final uh, membrane that we have is a connective tissue membrane. It's a synovial membrane. Um, basically this is going to line joint cavities um, is what we're going to have. So if I have a bone and a bone um, in between here I'm going to have a cavity that's going to be built and this is going to be a synovial membrane. Uh, synovial membranes themselves are going to have a fluid that's going to be in here. It's going to be called a synovial fluid. Um, basically, this is going to allow things to glide across relatively easily. Easily, um, When I take a look at this particular connective tissue membrane that we call a synovial membrane. Um, when we talk a little bit about the muscular system, when we get into the skeletal system, uh, we'll delve deeper into the actual uh, synovial membranes, um, and we'll take a look at them even closer and have to identify the different structures of a synovial membrane. But synovial membranes, your only membrane that you have in your body that's composed exclusively of connective tissue. Now we're going to move on to the organ system itself as the integumentary system. We know the skin is called a cutaneous membrane, but if I take this skin and I add all these accessory structures to it like sweat glands, oil glands, hair, nails, now I have the integumentary system. Um, and that's how I get to that integumentary, that organ system level. So I take the skin, then I add all these accessory structures to it, like the sweat glands, oil glands, hair, and nails, and now I have my whole entire integumentary system. Major functions of the integumentary system, it's going to protect you from mechanical damage, chemical damage, bacterial damage, UV light damage, uh, heat damage, protects you from drying out. Also, it's going to aid the body in heat loss or heat retention. Um, that's controlled by the, uh, the nervous system. We take a look at the glands. Um, aids in excretion of urea and ureic acid through sweating. And also is a, uh, aids in the process of development of uh, building vitamin D. We take a look at the skin structure itself. Um, you have the outer layer. Um, the part that you can touch is called the epidermis. Like I said, the epidermis is composed mostly of stratified squamous epithelial cells um, that are keratinized. They're hardened by keratin to prevent water loss. Um, is what they're there for. 
Um, it's avascular. And like I said, most of the cells are what we call keratinocytes secreting this keratin. Then we have underlying that uh, epidermis, we have the dermis, which is composed of dense connective tissue. This is what your skin looks like. You guys built a model of this, so you kind of know this pretty well when I take a look at the epidermis and then the dermis that's here. So beneath the, uh, the dermis itself, we have a subcutaneous layer of the skin that's called the hypodermis. This is mostly adipose tissue that we have. Um, it's deep. It's not technically, it's not part of the skin, but it anchors the skin to the underlying organs is what it is. It's mostly composed of adipose tissue. There's some areolar tissue in there as, as well um, to help join the, uh, join the skin to muscle or whatever is beneath it. So we take a look at layers of the epidermis. So the epidermis is, 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 uh, is composed of different layers um, that we call stratum. Um, we have the bottom layer that's called the stratum basal. Um, it's the deep layer of the epidermis. Um, it lies next to the dermis. Um, it has a wavy border uh, with the dermis to anchor the two together. Um, in, the, in the basal layer, this is where the cells are undergoing mitosis. So basically in the basal layer, you have this cell division that's occurring. And then these cells, as they divide, they get risen to the top. As they rise to the top, um, they're producing their keratinocytes. So they're producing this keratin. Um, they're becoming waterproof, and they're actually dying as they rise to the surface. And then once they reach the very top, they're considered dead. And then they get shed off, um, and they become what's called dander is what's happening. So after the basal layer, we have the spinosum, and then we have the granulosum. So it goes the stratum basal, the stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum. Then we have the stratum lucidum. Now the stratum lucidum is a layer that's only found in thick skin, um, like the soles of your feet or the palms of your hand has this stratum lucidum. Um, this is formed from dead cells uh, of the deeper strata. It occurs only in thick hairless, uh, like the palms and soles of the feet. Um, if it's not composed of thick skin, um, it just has a layer on top called the stratum corneum. Um, all skin has a corneum. Not all skin has a lucidum. Like I said, the lucidum is found only in the, uh, it's only found in thick skin. So the outer layer is called the stratum corneum. Um, and basically this is where we have a whole ton of dead cells that are all joined together, um, basically filled with keratin uh, to prevent water loss from the actual skin itself um, is why we have this keratin that's associated with it. So if we take a look at the deepest to the shallowest layers, we have the basal, the spinosum, the granulosum, the lucidum, and the corneum. I'll give you a question on the test dealing with a, a man steps on a splinter or something like that. What's the layers of the epidermis that this particular, uh, that this particular splinter will go through? And of course you would say, we well, start out going through the corneum, then the lucidum, then the granulosum, then the spinosum, then the basal layer. What this looks like, let me show you an image of what this actually looks like itself. So when I take a look, guys, at this layer that's here is down here, you're going to have the basal layer that's going to be right here. So right here is going to be this stratum basal that's going to be right here. So what I'm just drawing right now is the stratum basal. And with this, um, basically the cells are dividing at this la layer. And then they're getting pushed up and rising to the surface. And as they rise to the surface, they load up with keratin and then they die. Okay. And then once they're dead, they get pushed all the way to the surface when they're dead. And then they actually get shed off is what happens to them. But you have to know that this is the basal layer. Then moving up, we have the spinosum. Okay. We have the spinosum, which is going to be about right here. You have the granulosum that's about right here. Okay. Um, and then you have the lucidum, which is a clear layer that's going to sit right about here. And then all this right here, this is all the stratum corneum. So this whole entire layer right here is the corneum um, that you have here. But you can see that these are the different layers of the epidermis uh, when I take a look at it. Now beneath here, this is all the dermis. So this is all the dermis that's right here. I'm going to try to spell dermis. So this is all the dermis that's right here. And note that the, uh, the epidermis is, is avascular, um, so it doesn't have blood supply that's to it. But what happens is you have capillary loops that run up these things that we call dermal papillae, and they're actually bringing the nutrients to these skin cells themselves through these little tiny grooves that we have right here that we call dermal papillae. And then through osmosis and diffusion, uh, these cells are going to get the nutrients that they actually um, need. 
Now, I know that I said that the, the majority of cells in here are called keratinocytes that we take a look at in the epidermis, um, but there are some other cells that are of importance. Um, one cell that's important um, that you take a look right here, this is called a melanocyte. So this cell right here is called a melanocyte that's right here that I'm drawing on. And basically, melanocytes produce a chemical that's called melanin. And, uh, and melanin is what's going to give our skin its actual pigment itself. Uh, it gives skin its actual color that you have. It can vary from brown to a melanin can vary like brown uh, to a yellow light color that it has there. Um, we take a look at melanin. Now melanin is going to pre be produced uh, when we take a look at it. Um, basically, as a result of genetics, you can produce melanin. Uh, so like you look at people that are darker complected, um, like African Americans, um, they're going to produce more melanin than a person's let's of like Northern European uh, descent just because of the fact uh, of their genetics itself. Um, what melanin does is melanin basically protects uh, the cells from UV damage. It basically prevents their nuclei uh, from allowing uh, UV light to help pre penetrate the uh, uh, penetrate the nucleus is what it does of these cells. Um, so UV light can trigger the melanocytes to secrete melanin to give it the actual pigment itself of your skin is one way that we can get melanin production to actually occur. Um, when this melanin is secreted, it surrounds the outside of these keratinocytes um, basically to help protect that nucleus that's in here um, that contains the DNA and it prevents it from uh, or tries to help prevent it um, from mutations from actually occurring inside of there. Um, but by the time this melanin is produced, guys, um, your skin's already been burnt. It already has this damage that's actually occurred uh, with it. So uh, it only does so much when we take a look at this melanin itself. Um, eventually, when you're, if you're of Northern European descent, um, basically this melanin um, goes away um, or is produced less once that sun goes away, which is why a tan um, eventually dissipates uh, as these keratinocytes um, rise to the top and are released. Um, that's why your tan goes away. But that's melanin. Uh, melanin is produced by, by melanocytes, and uh, it has that protective property with that melanin. So there's your melanin. It's produced by melanocytes. Um, mostly these melanocytes hang out in the stratum basal layer. The color that they produce of this melanin is yellow, brown, to black. The uh, amount of melanin produced depends upon the genetics and exposure to the sunlight that we have. Different parts of your body are going to produce different levels of, your, of melanin. Like if we take a look at your lips and things like that, um, we notice that they tend to be a little bit different color than the surrounding skin. So those are your melanocytes that are in there, um, and that is uh, produce, uh, produces melanin. We take a look at the dermis. The dermis consists of two layers. You have the papillary layer. Um, in the papillary layer, you have these projections called dermal papillae, and these contain these capillary loops, and I just talked about that previously with those capillary loops. Also housed in there is going to be some pain receptors uh, and touch receptors that are going to go up into that particular area and communicate with the nervous system as to what's going on. Moving beneath the papillary layer, you have the reticular layer. It's the deepest layer of the skin. This is where you have major blood vessels, sweat and oil glands, and then you have deep pressure receptors that are located there. Mostly the dermis consists of, when we take a look, because it's a connective tissue, so there are fibers that are associated with this connective tissue, is collagen and elastin fibers are located throughout the dermis. Collagen fibers are going to give skin its toughness. Elastic fibers give uh, skin its elasticity. Uh, and the blood vessels play a role in temperature regulation um, with the skin itself. I can increase blood flow to the surface of my skin to help cool me down. I can decrease blood flow uh, to help warm me up uh, to, the, uh, to the surface of the skin. So this is going to play a role in temperature regulation as well as with your sweat glands and things like that. With these elastin fibers and collagen fibers, um, more increased exposure to UV light is going to also uh, cause degradation of these particular fibers themselves. If I destroy collagen fibers um, with UV light, by the time I'm 40, I wind up with something called wrinkles um, because that skin begins to sag um, as these collagen uh, is destroyed. UV light will destroy these collagen fibers. Elastic fibers um, can actually get overstretched um, during pregnancy, and you wind up with something that's called stretch marks. Um, bodybuilders wind up with stretch marks as well uh, when they lift a lot and their muscle goes really well, and then that actually stretches out their skin. So your skin only stretches so much, and it doesn't have that elasticity um, to it that it's going to like recoil back if you overstretch it. So that's where we get stretch marks at. We take a look at the papillary layer. You can see in this particular diagram itself, so this is going to be the papillary layer that's right here. And this is that layer that's basically consists of, this is the papillary layer of the dermis. So all this right here is the papillary layer of the dermis. And it has these 
loops that are coming up here in this particular fashion. And this is where we're going to house, like I said earlier, um, where we're going to have these, uh, these capillary loops that are going to run, um, these nerve endings are going to run up in those particular areas itself. And then beneath that you have the reticular layer. So the rest of this right here is all my reticular layer of the dermis itself. And then beneath here you're going to have the, uh, the fat's going to be down here. This is going to be your subcutaneous layer that's going to hang out in this particular area. Um, we talked a little bit about, uh, I should add this earlier, um, but when I talked a little bit about the melanin, um, that's one of the skin color determinants. Also, in your diet, you can get carotene, uh, which is from some vegetables. Uh, I believe in carrots and stuff like that can give an orange pigment to your skin. Hemoglobin, having blood run to the surface of your skin, is also going to give the, uh, the skin its, its color as well. So like when I get nervous or something like that, I increase blood flow to the surface of my skin. These are some alterations. Redness um, that can have is arrhythmia. Uh, can be embarrassment, inflammation, hypertension, fever, or an allergy can cause redness of the skin. Increasing that, uh, that blood flow to that particular area. Decreasing the blood flow uh, re results in something called pallor, um, which is emotional stress, like if I get uh, scared, um, low blood pressure, uh, or just decreasing blood flow to a particular area of your body is going to cause a, uh, a whiteness of your skin. Um, jaundice is yellowing of the skin. It's a liver disorder. And then we can have bruises that happen underneath the skin um, and form hematomas when you have this capillary um, that, that busts open um, and doesn't have a way to escape. So then you wind up with bruising underneath your skin. But these are all skin color determinants or things that cause your skin to have different colors that are associated with it. Um, these are, this is one of the, uh, the disorders with, uh, with the melanocytes in the epidermis. Um, this is called vitiligo. Um, with vitiligo, it's an autoimmune disorder. And this particular autoimmune disorder, the melanocytes are under attack. Um, so your white blood cells begin to attack the melanocytes. Don't know why it happens, um, but a person has their melanocytes under attack. They have this blotchy lightness um, like effect on certain areas of their body where these melanocytes have been attacked. Um, if you're a dermatologist, you give these individuals concealers um, or a makeup cream um, that's going to help hide the, uh, the effects of this vitiligo. This is albinism, and albinism is you have melanocytes, um, but genetically speaking, these melanocytes don't have the ability to produce melanin, so they can't go out into the sun or they're going to struggle to be in the sun for long periods of time because their skin is going to burn relatively easily. Um, also happens to their, uh, also is going to happen as well to their, uh, their hair and things like that, has a white-like appearance. We take a look at appendages of the skin. Um, so we take a look at some of the major skin appendages that we have embedded within the skin as we have various glands. Um, all the glands of the skin are, uh, are exocrine glands. They're not endocrine glands. Um, we have hair, we have hair follicles, and we have nails. So the first uh, gland that I'm going to talk a little about is an oil gland. It's called a sebaceous gland. The sebaceous gland is going to produce oil. Um, this oil we call sebum. It acts as a lubricant for the skin. It prevents hair from becoming brittle. It also kills bacterium. Sometimes these sebaceous glands are associated with a hair follicle. Um, if we take a look at the skin model, um, you can see that there's a... Uh, just let me blow this up real quick. So you can see in this skin model, guys, these little green things I have right here um, that I'm pointing to right there, um, those are sebaceous glands. Um, basically act like little oil cans. They're going to secrete um, this particular sebum. Um, onto a, uh, a hair follicle, and then as this hair rises to the surface, um, then it has that oil that's going to be associated with it. Sometimes these little tiny glands here, guys, um, aren't going to be associated with a hair follicle um, at all, but they're just going to secrete their product directly into a duct that's going to rise to the surface of the skin and secrete that oil that's going to help kill bacterium um, as well. These, uh, these glands are only activated at puberty, um, which is why if you feel a baby's hair or a baby's hair, I um, mean, note that it's really soft in structure when you look at a baby's hair because these sebaceous glands have not been activated yet. We also have sweat glands. Um, sweat glands we call sudoriferous glands. They produce sweat. They're widely distributed in the skin. We have two different types of sweat glands. Um, one's more widely distributed. That's an eccrine gland. Eccrine glands open via ducts on the pores of the surface of the skin. The sweat that they produce is going to be that clear sweat that you're all too familiar with. Then we have another gland that's called an apocrine gland. It's a sweat gland, um, but the sweat that it produces isn't clear. Um, the sweat is milky, uh, yellowish in color because it also contains fatty acids and proteins. We find apocrine glands. Um, they begin to function at puberty. Um, their location is often associated with, uh, we take a look at our, our, our armpits, um, is where we have these apocrine glands, also in our pubic region. 
Um, those glands are also associated with apocrine glands. And the sweat that they produce tends to be a little bit thicker. You may have heard of armpit stains or pit stains, they call them. And that's because when you sweat in your armpit, um, it secretes that that fat-like molecule that gets embedded into the fabric um, of your shirts and things like that, and it's very hard to get out. Um, like I said, these glands, apocrine glands, are only activated at puberty. One of the reasons that babies don't wear deodorant and things like that until you get to your adolescent stage because these apocrine glands have not been activated yet. We take a look at sweat. Um, sweat's mostly composed of water. There's some salts, some vitamin Cs. Um, metabolic waste is in there like urea is going to be in there and then we also find in the uh, in the apocrine gland we find these fatty acids and proteins basic function of sweat is going to help dissipate heat basically you sweat on the surface of your skin it's going to help cool you as this air comes across it so it helps cool you down it also gets rid of waste products also inhibits bacterial growth because it is acidic in nature the odor that's associated with the sweat is associated with the bacterium Next thing we're going to talk a little bit about is hair. Hair is going to be produced in a hair follicle. Um, it consists of basically hardened keratinized epithelial cells. So we take these epithelial cells and we push them all together and we wind up with hair. Uh, what gives hair its color is the melanocytes. They're hanging out at the bottom in that hair bulb itself. The hair grows in a matrix in the hair bulb um, in the stratum basal. Basically when I look at a, a hair follicle, let me go back here kind of far. So when I look at a hair follicle itself, basically it's the stratum basal has been pushed down is what it has happened here. So when I look at a hair follicle itself, you can see the stratum basal has been basically pushed down, and then now this structure is just going to generate what we call a hair, is what's going to grow out of this particular area. So hair is produced by this hair follicle. We talked about the cells. We talked about the melanocytes a little bit. Um, this is a hair follicle that's right here. Um, and this is your hair growing that's right into here is where your hair is going to grow. So I can basically see you have blood vessels that are running right up into here. Okay, here's your melanocytes that are hanging out right here. These melanocytes are going to give basically the same thing. Um, they're going to secrete a certain color of melanin that's going to give your hair its actual color itself. The hair follicle consists of a dermal sheath, which is the outside sheath of it. Then it has an epidermal sheath, um, which is the internal sheath of it. And then you have uh, the growth bulb that's going to be here. Um, in this uh, bulb is where your hair is going to grow. So my hair is going to grow in here, and it's going to rise to the surface is what it's actually going to, uh, is what it's going to do. Um, but that's the basics of your actual uh, hair follicle and the growth of your hair. Um, like I said, there's your melanocytes that are there. We take a look at hair itself, the anatomy of hair, as a central area that we call the medulla. Um, then you have the cortex that surrounds the medulla. And then the outside is called the cuticle. Uh, the cuticle has the most keratin that's associated with it. So there's your layers of your hair that you have, the central medulla. Then you have your cortex and you have the cuticle. You can get something called split ends in which the cuticle gets split uh, in the actual hair itself. Another, uh, we take a look at the, the hair follicle. Like I said, it consists of the dermal and epi, epi, epidermal sheath that surrounds the hair root. Um, you have muscles that are attached to the hair follicles. They're called erector pili muscles. Um, these can be stand up in like times of fright. Um, also, these erector pili muscles become activated when you become cold and you begin to shake, um, those types of things. Um, from an evolutionary standpoint, that hair standing up on its ends to make you look bigger and scarier is what the, uh, one of the purposes that we have of it. Uh, we have sebaceous glands, sudoriferous glands that we talked about as well. There's this erector pili muscle. This is just going to show you, like, when I take a look at the, the cuticle of your, of your hair itself, um, they, they're kind of formed like shingles when I look at these cells here. Um, so they're kind of pushed on top of one another um, and shingle-like. Another appendage of the skin that I have is nails. Uh, nails are, are scale-like modifications of the epidermis. Um, they're heavily uh, keratinized just like your hair is. Uh, basically, the stratum basal is going to extend beneath the nail bed. Um, this is responsible for growth. 
Um, it lacks pigment, um, makes them colorless, which is why your nails are colorless when we take a look at them. We take a look at structures of your nail. You have a free edge. Um, the body is the visible attached portion. Um, the root of the nail is embedded within the skin. And then the cuticle is part of the nail fold that, that in, uh, projects into the nail body itself. Um, so this is the basics of your nail itself. This is the body of the nail that's right here. So this is the body of the nail that's right here, the part that is visible. Um, this is the free edge, the part that comes off of the actual surface itself is what we call the free edge that's right here. Um, this is the cuticle right here. This is that skin fold that's right here. It's called the cuticle of your nail. The part where this nail comes out right here is called the lanula. So this right here is called the lanula, lanula, lanula. And we can see that this is basically how your nail grows. It's from the stratum basal layer that's right here. And then this nail is going to grow in an outward-like fashion. This particular way is how your nail is going to grow. Your nail does not grow upward, it grows outward. Um, I used to think for some reason way back in the day when we took anatomy phys that your nail grew up like this, but it does not. It grows outward fashion like this is how a nail actually grows. So those are some of the key characteristics of nails. Next thing we take a look at about is, is burns. Um, burns are basically tissue damage um, and cell death. It's caused by heat, electricity, UV radiation, or chemicals. Um, one of the major associated dangers with, uh, with burns is dehydration. You can get electrolyte imbalance, and you can wind up getting, uh, going into circulatory shock uh, as a result if, uh, if you lose uh, enough uh, water and you dry out enough from, uh, from, the, loss of, uh, from the loss of skin. Remember, your skin uh, helps protect you um, from drying out. Um, we have the rule of nines. Um, if you divide um, your basic your, uh, body into 11 areas for quick estimation, each area represents about 9% of the total body surface that we have there. This is kind of the, the rule of nines that we have. Um, when we take a look at those. But basically, we divide these burns into severity. Um, you have a first-degree burn, uh, which is only the epidermis is damaged. It's red and swollen, so like a, a, a sunburn um, can be a, a first-degree burn. A second-degree burn is when we have the epidermis and the upper part of the dermis is damaged. Um, basically, you know, the difference between a first-degree burn and a second-degree burn is if I find that I have blisters. So if blisters are appearing, that's when the epidermis is separated from the dermis and a fluid's gone in between that particular area. Um, that's a second-degree burn. If we destroy even more layers of the, uh, the dermis itself and we get like a black or gray-like color, that's a third-degree burn. Um, it's going to be painless because you've destroyed those nerve receptors. So these are the different types of burns that I can have. Here's my first-degree burn. Here's my second-degree burn that I have. Um, you can see there's a blister there. And then my third-degree burn, you have a graining um, or a blackening of the skin. Um, if over 25% of your body has a second-degree burn, it's considered critical. Critical means that you're, you have a, a chance of dying, uh, a higher chance of dying. Um, if you have 10% of your body um, has a third-degree burn, that's considered critical. Um, and then also, if there's third-degree burns, guys, that are on your face, hands, or feet, um, this is also a critical condition or, or critical burn. Some of the homeostatic imbalances also of the skin are just not burns. We can get infections. Um, we can get something called athlete's foot, which is basically a fungal infection of the foot when uh, basically it happens in the webbing um, of your feet. Um, basically, this fungus grows. Um, a lot of times when you go on to college and things like that, um, athlete's foot is notorious for being in those particular showers. Uh, those community showers in college, which is why they always recommend that you wear those, uh, those sandals uh, when you're going to take a shower. Um, you can have a bacterial infection that winds up being a boil. Um, you can get a cold sore, which is a viral infection. It could be a herpes virus um, that can cause uh, a cold sore. Also, um, these are some infections and allergies that can occur. Um, contact dermatitis is when you have uh, an exposure uh, that causes an allergic reaction. Things like poison ivy can be contact dermatitis. Uh, another bacterial infection we have is called impetigo. Uh, psoriasis, it, it's not known what causes psoriasis. Um, can be caused by trauma, um, infection, or some type of stress. This is your cold sore. This is impetigo. And then here is, uh, here is psoriasis. Next thing we have is different types of cancers that we can have. 
um, of the body. Uh, basically, a cancer is an abnormal cell mass. Cells don't stop uh, growing. Uh, we have a benign tumor and we have a malignant tumor. Benign, um, it doesn't spread into surrounding tissue. When I have a benign, it stays localized. Uh, malignant has the ability to metastasize and move to other parts of the body. So when we take a look at classifying cancers, if it's benign, it doesn't have the chance of spreading or, or hasn't spread yet. And then a malignant uh, tumor has the ability to spread and move to other parts of the body. Uh, benign is a better uh, is is a better between the two. Uh, malignant, I mean, it's going to spread. It has the ability to spread. Um, you want to get that taken care of. Uh, the most common type of cancer is skin cancer. First type of uh, skin cancer that we have is called basal cell carcinoma. So this is going to start from the basal cells. It's the least malignant type of uh, cancer, skin cancer that you can get. So that means it has the least likelihood of spreading. Um, like I said, it arises from the stratum basal. This is a basal cell carcinoma. It kind of looks like a pimple. Next one I have is squamous cell carcinoma. It arises from the uh, stratum spinosum. It metastasizes, so it has me, uh, if it's not removed, um, it has the ability to spread to lymph nodes. Um, but if you get it removed early, like all types of cancer, there's a good chance that you're going to be fine. This one's believed to be sun-induced, so that UV light exposure increases your likelihood of developing squamous cell uh, carcinoma. This is what it looks like. Um, it kind of has a speckling effect that's with it uh, as well. It's not as raised when you look at squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, malignant melanoma, this is the most deadly of the skin cancers. Um, it's cancer of the melanocytes, so the melanocytes develop a cancer in them. This can spread rapidly to the lymph nodes and blood vessels. Uh, when we go to detect this uh, type of cancer or types of cancer in general of the skin, we use the ABCD rule. Uh, a is for is it asymmetrical, B is for is there border irregularly, irregularity, C is for color, does it have color discrepancies in it, and D is for diameter. If the diameter is greater than the head of a pencil, then you're going to want to get that looked at. So this is A for asymmetrical, um, two sides uh, don't match, B is border irregularity, the border of the uh, uh, are not smooth, C is there are different colors in that particular area. Um, and then D, uh, the diameter is uh, larger than 6 millimeters. They always use the head of a, a pencil eraser is a good one for the diameter when I take a look at it. This is melanoma. And you can see this definitely has all those characteristics that it's asymmetrical. The borders are irregular. Um, it's larger than the head of a pencil. Um, and it has this color that's associated with it that's different than the surrounding uh, types of, uh, than the surrounding skin itself. So that is the, uh, the end of chapter four, guys. Um, don't forget, guys, I know that we had a quick turnaround on this particular uh, test. We're going from chapter three into chapter four. Um, but uh, this is one of those tests, guys, um, that if you put in a, a little bit of effort um, about five days prior to the test, um, you're going to do well. So if I study like 20 minutes on a Monday, you know, 20 minutes on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday I study for 20 minutes, and on a Thursday I might get an hour in. Um, then you're going to do better than uh, studying for this particular test itself rather than be that kid that just studies the night before. So make sure you're preparing in advance. In advance. Look at your uh, review guide. Um, that's how I generate most of the questions from your test is right off the, uh, the review guide or knowing those topics that are discussed in the review guide. Start and pause this video at certain places if you're having trouble uh, uh, learning these particular ideas itself. And then as always, like I say, um, see me before school, after school if you have any questions. I wish you guys the best of luck when preparing for the Chapter 4 test.